This part of the test will measure your listening ability when it comes to the conversations and lectures in academic settings. You will listen to a recording and then answer questions about it. You will be able to take notes while listening and you can listen to the recording only once. The questions must be answered in the presented order. During the exam, you will not be allowed to go back to the previous question. The questions will be about the main idea and the supporting details. Some questions will be about the speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speaker. Sometimes you will see this icon. It means that you will have to listen to a certain segment of the recording and answer a question about it. Now listen to the lecture. Marine fish, known as the leafy sea dragon, is unique to Australia's southern and western coasts. It's a species that, because of its distinct form and behavior, has caught the attention of marine biologists like myself. The physical characteristics of the leafy sea dragon are among its most striking traits. It looks less like a fish and more like floating seaweed due to its long, slender body covered in appendages that resemble leaves. Its complex camouflage protects it from predators and aids in its survival. However, it also poses a problem because it makes it challenging to study the sea dragon in its natural environment. In fact, I had to take a second look the first time I saw one in the wild to make sure I wasn't just observing a piece of drifting kelp. The leafy sea dragon is noteworthy for its method of reproduction. Contrary to many fish species where females are responsible for carrying eggs, the male sea dragon fulfills this function. The male carries the fertilized eggs until they hatch from the female's egg deposit onto his brood patch. This change in parental duties is thought to be a response to the challenging circumstances in their habitat, giving children a better chance of surviving. Additionally, despite having a delicate and unthreatening appearance, leafy sea dragons are ferocious carnivores that primarily eat plankton and small crustaceans. Their feeding technique is absolutely amazing. They use their long, pipe-like snouts to suck their prey in, a method that is both effective and unexpected considering their usually friendly nature. Along with these features, I want to clear up a few misconceptions people have about the leafy sea dragon. They are not linked to dragons or any other mythical creatures, despite their name and appearance. They are a member of the Cygnothidae family, which also contains pipefish and seahorses. Second, contrary to popular belief, they are not proficient swimmers. In fact, they only use their tiny translucent fins for steering and mostly rely on ocean currents for locomotion. What is the main idea of a lecture? How does the professor feel about the leafy sea dragon? What does the professor imply when he mentions the leafy sea dragon's feeding method?
How does the leafy sea dragon's appearance contribute to its survival? Which of the following are discussed as part of the leafy sea dragon's characteristics in the lecture? According to the lecture, why is the leafy sea dragon listed as near threatened? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Good afternoon. I was hoping to learn more about the leadership development and skill building opportunities at our school. Hello, certainly. Our university offers a diverse range of workshops and programs. For instance, we have the student leadership program that helps develop your leadership skills. That sounds interesting. What does the program entail? It's a multi-level program where you attend workshops, participate in community service, and work on real-life projects. The objective is to equip you with practical leadership skills. I see. That's a great opportunity. And what about the skill-building workshops? We offer a variety of workshops, from public speaking and conflict resolution to uh, critical thinking and effective communication. These are aimed at honing your soft skills. That's comprehensive. I'm a bit concerned, though. I'm majoring in engineering, and my schedule is quite tight. Well, we understand that our students have varied schedules, and we've designed the programs accordingly. Many workshops are available online, and some during the weekends. That's a relief. I definitely want to participate. Any specific workshops you'd recommend for an engineering major? Given your field, I'd highly recommend the problem-solving and critical thinking workshops. They're not directly engineering-related, but the skills you gain are invaluable in any profession. What is the main topic of the discussion? What does the administrator imply when recommending the problem-solving and critical thinking workshops? How does the student feel about the leadership development and skill building opportunities?
What is the administrator's attitude when the student expresses concern about her tight schedule? What can be inferred about the student leadership program from the administrator's description? Now listen to the lecture. Leonardo was born in Vinci, Italy, around 1452. Anne was apprenticed to the artist Andrea del Verricchio in Florence at an early age. Here he picked up a variety of technical abilities, such as drafting, chemistry, metallurgy, metalworking, plaster casting, leather making, mechanics, and carpentry as well as fresh viewpoints that would have a lasting impact on his artistic style. The work of Leonardo da Vinci, known for its inventive use of perspective and detail, advanced the idea that art might be used as a tool for investigation, rather than merely as ornament during the Renaissance. His most well-known pieces, The Last Supper and The Mona Lisa, serve as examples of this strategy. Leonardo's deep interest in the human mind and the natural environment is evident in the Mona Lisa's enigmatic grin and the ambient illusionism of her rural background. On the other hand, his mastery of perspective and anatomy was on full display in The Last Supper, which produced a sense of reality and emotional depth. Don't forget, though, that Leonardo was more than just a painter. He made observations that were years ahead of their time scientifically. He drew diagrams of the human body, various flora, animals, and technologies like the parachute, helicopter, and tank in his notebooks. Even though many of his inventions were never put into practice during his lifetime, they showed just how broad and forward-thinking his curiosity was. It is hard to talk about Leonardo da Vinci without mentioning his influence on later generations of scientists and artists. He pioneered the path for the fusion of art and science, by urging artists to pay close attention to nature, comprehend the workings of the human body, and employ light and perspective to give their work depth. Leonardo was a genius because he was gifted in many areas and combined art and science in a way that was unheard of at the time. He was motivated by an insatiable curiosity and the conviction that all areas of knowledge are interrelated. This philosophy is embodied in his painting, The Vitruvian Man, a study of the human body's proportions that combines art, anatomy, and geometry. Leonardo was more than just a man, in my opinion. He was a force of nature, a universal genius, whose discoveries continue to motivate us now. This is because of the range of his interests and abilities. One experiences an overwhelming sense of amazement for his accomplishments the more one digs into his life and work. Leonardo da Vinci was a major character of the Renaissance, who was known for his scientific research and multidisciplinary approach to knowledge, as well as his creative prowess. Every artist who has the guts to approach the world with a scientist's curiosity and every scientist who recognizes the aesthetic splendor of the natural world carry on his heritage. What is the main idea of the lecture?
In the Mona Lisa, what did Leonardo da Vinci focus on? How does the professor feel about Leonardo da Vinci's impact on subsequent generations of artists and scientists? When the professor states, He was motivated by an insatiable curiosity and the conviction that all areas of knowledge are interrelated. What does the professor mean? Considering the statement, This philosophy is embodied in his painting of the Vitruvian Man. What is the professor implying about the painting? Which of the following were discussed as parts of Leonardo da Vinci's life and work, and which were not? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, I'm really struggling to find a job after graduation. Can you suggest some strategies? Absolutely. Have you started networking with professionals in your field of interest? Well, not really. I feel awkward reaching out to strangers. I understand. However, networking is a critical component of job searching. It's not only about asking for a job, but also learning about the industry and making connections. I see. I'll try to work on that. What else can I do? Another important aspect is tailoring your resume and cover letter for each job you apply to. Generic applications often get overlooked. That sounds like a lot of work. It is, but remember, quality over quantity. It's better to have well-crafted applications for fewer jobs than generic ones for hundreds. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. But what about interviews? Practice makes perfect. Anticipate common interview questions and prepare your responses. And always remember to follow up after the interview. I'm nervous about interviews, but I'll definitely try that. Thanks for the advice. You're welcome. Stay persistent. And don't get discouraged if you face rejections. It's part of the process. What is the main idea of this dialogue?
What does the career counselor imply when he says? It's better to have well-crafted applications for fewer jobs than generic ones for hundreds. How does the student feel about networking with professionals? Based on the dialogue, what is the career counselor's attitude towards job rejections? What does the career counselor suggest about preparing for interviews? Now listen to the lecture. Since the beginning of time, the sun in all of its manifestations has been a captivating motif. Across numerous cultures, its potent influence has been a constant in human artistic expression. The sun is a common emblem of life, vitality, and rebirth in the world of art. This idea has its origins in prehistoric societies that revered the sun as a god. Because of the sun's ability to maintain life, People worshipped it. They noticed how the sunrise and sunset were cyclical, which inspired them to connect the sun with the ideas of life, death, and rebirth. The sun now has deeper meanings when used in more modern circumstances. For instance, the sun can also stand for illumination and optimism. It is a lighthouse that dispels the shadows and symbolizes the victory of knowledge over ignorance. The image of a rising sun can convey hope and the promise of a better tomorrow in situations of gloom or adversity. The sun is now viewed as a symbol of selfhood or the person on a more abstract level. An individual can consider oneself to be the center of their own world, much as the sun is at the center of our solar system. Expressionist paintings in particular replete with this portrayal. It's interesting to note that the sun's symbolism also includes its absence. Scenes at night, when the sun is noticeably gone, can imply mystery, doubt, or even fear. Thus, a dichotomy between the sun and its absence deepens the symbolic vocabulary of art. In art, the sun has served as a nuanced and potent symbol. Its enduring significance is demonstrated by the various ways that different cultures and eras have interpreted it. So, think about what the sun might represent the next time you see it in a piece of art. It might merely make clear a deeper level of meaning that was previously hidden. What is the main idea of a lecture?
According to the lecture, what is the sun often associated with in ancient civilizations? How does the professor feel about the sun's symbolic representation in art? What deeper meaning is implied when the professor says? Thus, a dichotomy between the sun and its absence deepens the symbolic vocabulary of art. What is the professor implying when he mentions the sun as a symbol of selfhood and expressionist art? Why does the professor mention night scenes in the context of the sun's symbolic representation? <laughs> 